Tasio, whose last Got name it. I just learned to say pro- properly. <laughs> um, and you guys all know Andrew Sides, my occasional co-host. Um, how are you guys doing today? Good. Hanging in. It's been a busy morning, but uh, yeah, yeah you're, kind of you're a busy guy. <laughs> Like uh, we were just trying to get you to sign up for Discord. I'm like, hmm, how do I how do I send a message <laughs> to this guy? And I was like looking on your uh, I was looking through Facebook Messenger first, and then I was like, I couldn't oh, message you on Discord. Discord was like, this dude hasn't added you, so you can't even talk to him. And I was like, I, okay. I think I've done, I've done my best to limit my conduits so I can just try to it's, stay focused. I gotta admit. Yeah. I, uh, if, I know that it's really hip right now to be on everything on TikTok, on Twitch, on Discord, on every oh. social media platform, and I just feel like uh, I'm, I'm just kind of just putting a knife in it and just saying enough. You know, like Facebook Messenger, I can't stand it. Um, yeah, yeah, Messenger, I try to move all my friends. I've moved a bulk of my friends away from Messenger into just Discord, and I try to keep everything in Discord mainly because all my. Uh, ancient one social media like all the stuff i do for the projects i have my own server and everything sits in discord so yeah it's like my go-to spot for everyone to learn about what i'm working on but it's been a little you know you can't avoid you try to avoid facebook messenger and stuff but some people just don't want to leave it yeah i've got two friends that that i like they're it's pretty much them that I'm, i'm only on facebook messenger for Cause like we still all chat and like, they're some of my closest friends. So yeah. they're the only reason I have it around for that. Otherwise like no one else contacts me through that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm still email. I'm still texting. With you are app. actually really good at responding to emails, which is good. A lot of people are, um, I know I'm, my, I'm bad at it. You know, my cousin. My client, yeah. That's yeah. what my clients get me. So I better be paying yeah. attention. So you, you know, got your so. clients and then you got me <laughs> just like messing with oh. me. No, I mean your friends too. I mean, you yeah. know, like honestly, I'm still I'm so old school that like what I tell people who are like in my circles, I basically say, look, forget the text, forget the emails, just voice call me for God's sake. Because yeah. I'm so faster with like I'm not one of those guys that gets on the phone and you know they ask me the question and I start saying, well, how are you doing and how is your family and how are you getting through COVID? We just say it, we get it done, and we just hang up on each other. And there's no there's no ugliness. There's no. Uh, you know, lack of courtesy, but it's just in and out. And I'm so much faster with that than I am sitting there trying to do my work while I'm constantly trying to text people. It just, I cannot text and draw at the same time. There's, I have yet to find the artist that can text and draw literally simultaneously. I mean, you can do one or the other while you're kind of keeping your eyes on both, but you can't draw and text at the same time. So I just throw the thing in a, in a drawer, frustrate all my friends, unless they just want to listen <laughs> And voice call me and just say, "Hey, I have this question," and we answer it, and then I hang up. So, you're you're on that list if you want, man. I, we can uh, make that happen. You can just be one of those guys that just calls me, and says, "Hey, what about this?" I answer it, and then we move on. You know? Yeah, I mean that's cool. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I was like, I was, I had a mild panic this morning where I was just like, "Hmm, how do I get a hold of this guy?" <laughs> yeah, but uh, no, it's, cool. no, it's all good. Uh, we can talk about that later. Um, but let's talk about you because that's what we got you on the show. Um, yeah. So I briefly have, you know, you sent me some stuff to look over, which is great because I was trying to figure out exactly. I know you have a lot of side projects that you can't talk about yet. And then you have projects that you can talk about. Um, Obviously, you know, you've been in the business for 25 years. So that's a long time. That's a lot longer than Andrew and myself. Oh, God, yeah. Do you you want to start like from recent and then kind of work backwards? Or do you want to go past it real real quick and then move forward from there? I think it's however you guys want, but like, I'll tell you, I'll give you a, an insight. So this last uh, month on my Twitter, I guess, and on my Facebook, and I, I think also on Instagram, and I think about it, I guess on all three of those, I've been kind of posting um, every day something from my last 25 years, kind of celebrating the 25th anniversary. Mm. Today is the last post, actually. Today is the 25 of 25, and I just posted it right before I came on the air here. And um, it's like the most looking back I've done in a very very long time because i make it i'm almost uh i'm I'm like a psychopath about i don't want to look backwards i mean literally i don't know you guys are probably saying there's probably a lot of artists watching this that are the same and that you know the older your work gets the more you dislike it maybe they're yeah yeah i'd have a hard time showing a lot of my i don't hate my older stuff because i know it's what made me it brought me to where i am now but i look at it like what were you even thinking when you made this? Yeah. You know, I, 
I have work that from like 10 years ago is a completely different artist because I was in a totally different field and stuff. And it's like, yeah, this isn't, I can't even call it myself at this point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, looking back at that stuff every day for the last 25 days or so, you know, it just, it, it further reinforces that I'm, I'm really not a guy that likes looking in the rearview mirror. I mean, it, I think most good artists usually are probably that way. And I'm not saying, yeah. I'm, a good, I'm just saying that I know I'm programmed that way. So I'm probably in the right field in that nostalgia is not really my game when it comes to my own work. I mean, it's like, what have I done? What did I do, do yesterday? And what am I going to do tomorrow? And it, most importantly, what am I doing right now? And, you know, how yeah. am I pushing it? So, yeah, you can go in whatever order you want. I'll answer whatever you want or try to. I think it would be nice to, to hear, like, about your growth from where you started to where you are, because I think a lot of people are on that same boat right now. All right. Fire away. Do you want me to start or you want to ask Yeah, man, something? knock yourself out. Yeah. Um, um, well, yeah, so it's... basically, um, I am... I never like to call myself a self-taught artist, but I'm, um, I, cause I guess we all are in a way, even if we, even if we, More even, even if we went to school, we still had to learn. Like, I, I feel like I learned the bulk of what I know outside of school. Obviously most of yeah, us did. From the, from the people that you decide to put around you, your collection of friends yeah. and co and the people you look up to. So, um, nobody's creating a vacuum and I'm no different. Uh, but, um, <clears throat> Yeah, I, I didn't have an art school education. Um, I'm a kid who grew up with comics in his DNA, um, basically reading comics literally from the word go. Like my first reading material is superhero comics, DC, Marvel. And we're talking way back in the 70s because I'm, I'm an ancient guy. Yeah. Uh, so I, I grew up with comics and it's kind of it's how I learned how to read. And it was growing up, it was what I wanted to do when I, when I was an adult. And, you know, as you go through school, um, you know, things happen and people say, well, you can't really make a, make money in art. I was one of those guys that kept getting sure. told um, that. And then when I got into high school, um, you know, I got some scholarship opportunities. It's just long story short. Um, grades were good and colleges gave me offers, but not for art. It was for academic stuff. And um, coming from my family, um, hardworking, blue collar, Mexican-American family uh, who didn't have a whole lot of college experience in the family and so i was getting a shot at a four-year ride not fully paid but pretty well and um and so there was a lot of pressure to go for a professional degree quote unquote i'm sure there's mm -hmm, people right. who heard that trip from their parents and so what does that mean of course that means doctor lawyer engineer yeah i'm uh, supposed to be a pharmacist or a doctor <laughs> so. go, right and so of course being the dork that i was i said well drawing is it for me that's that's the beginning the middle and the end so what professional degree can you draw with well architects get to draw all day so i chose architecture and it was literally that stupid of a decision of just saying well architecture you can draw all day so I'll, maybe i'll go for that degree because that'll please them and i can draw mm -hmm. so i went to ut austin university of texas at austin um on a pretty significant series of scholarships that got me through the five-year program um but there was a, a trip in third third year of architecture school where we uh, they took some students to Europe and um, and I was on that trip and I would say that was the pivot point for me so what year is that that's about that's the fall of 1990 so think about what's kind of happening at that point you've got um, vertigo and the Sand mm -hmm. you know, Sandman yeah. comic uh, yeah vertigo's kind of finding its legs at that point it's not really hit its stride but it's finding its legs um, there was a graphic novel called violent cases by Dave McKean, or by Neil Gaiman and Dave McKean. Oh, yeah. I think it was their first graphic novel. And I think that had just come out at that point. And I think I found a black and white volume, not a color volume, but an original British black and white volume when I was on that trip. Um, John Muth's painted graphic novel work, his early stuff like Moonshadow was around. Um, Kent Williams' early painted stuff. Uh, George Pratt's Enemy Ace. All of that oh, painted... Oh, yeah. wow. Yeah. All of that painted graphic novel stuff was just was everything to me at that point and then and then i get thrown into all these museums in europe and all of these um you know uh comic book stores actually i was always playing hooky for my projects to go to the comic book stores in all the cities that we went and so uh i, I all that stuff was happening when i was about 20 i guess so still no art school education but that that educate that that i guess that influx of um stimuli on top of just drawing constantly started to shift me let's just put it that way yeah. where i really understood that 
in a very profound way that just drawing other people's buildings was not going to cut it. it mm -hmm. You know, I, um, and so that, that trip, I kind of knew the days were numbered for architecture. So just to kind of speed this along, um, I got my degree in architecture, started working as an intern architect, but all along while I'm sort of, what, what, what do you call yourself, Alan? What do you say? Like artist by day, hero by night. Yeah. I well, somebody actually that. read that. <laughs> I don't think so anyone I, actually read that. <laughs> by day and comic book dork by night. And I don't mean yeah. collector. I mean like sitting there trying to figure out the nuts and bolts of writing and drawing my own comics, yeah. of publishing them. Because again, we're talking around 93, 94 at this point. That's like the height of it at that point. Yep. Yeah. Exactly, man. Yeah, that's when that black and white independent boom was happening. Um, Dave Sim from Cerebus was very kind and kind oh, of yeah. gave a little bit of a boost to me and the guy that I was working with, a guy named Fernando Ramirez. Um, we did a book called Words and Pictures and, um, and we put out a couple of issues of it and book publishers started seeing the work that I was doing in there and the covers look nothing like my work now. They're very photo driven. Um, uh, again, I, I, I think at that point I'm drawing a lot, but I don't have the confidence in my drawing chops, if you know what I'm saying. I think we've all been through that, right? Yeah. So, you know, my stuff is very pen and ink as far as my sequential storytelling, but my covers are very photographic. Um, they're not really, again, I'm not trusting my drawing skills enough at that point. But uh, the covers still start to get noticed by book publishers. By, and so this one book publisher called Mojo Press out of Texas no longer around, but they came and said, uh, would you like to do this cover for a Michael Moorcock book? And I knew who Mike Moorcock was. I knew he was a huge, huge deal in fantasy literature. But um, but I didn't have interest in this stuff at that moment. I was interested in doing comics. And so they kept right. pushing. They said, wouldn't you like to do this cover? This would be really great. And I said, well, who does the interiors? And who does the typesetting? And who does the, the jacket layout? And who designs the end flaps? And they said, why do you want to know all that? And it's like, well, well, if nobody's doing it, could I do it? Mm -hmm. And they said, have you ever had experience doing it? And I said, well, you're asking me to do the cover illustration, but I've never had experience doing that. So why can't I do these things too? Completely arrogant 20-something answer. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. basically I said, if I can build a house, why can't I build a book? And I guess that was enough for them to say, all right, let's give this dummy you know, a shot at this and <laughs> let him design this entire book and do all the work. They offered me a nice little chunk of money and I did it. And the process of doing that book not just the cover, but starting to understand just how books are put together. What's the, not just the, the actual physical construction of a book, but how you think through all the layout elements and down to the typesetting yeah. and having to do that myself. I just absolutely fell in love. And, and I think, and I just posted this this morning on um, Facebook and Twitter. I'll post it on Instagram after this, but Moorcock himself, I don't know how many people out there are familiar with Michael Moorcock, but this is a guy that comes around in, the early 60s, especially into the mid 60s in, in England. And he's, I guess, what is he like? 17 years old in the 60s and puts out a, a fanzine called New Worlds where he's like the editor, editorial oh, director. Yeah. And you got like J.G. Ballard, um, let's see, M. John Harrison comes from his sphere. Um, God, I'm, I'm gonna start blanking on all these names, but there's, there's a huge influx of of uh how do you say this what i guess at that point would be considered sort of an alternative scene of science fiction authors that come that much like with the music uh scene at that point with the beatles having creating a british invasion of the u.s the, these authors eventually not maybe as fast as the beatles influenced music but those authors start to infect the way american or u.s science fiction and fantasy work he creates this character called elric uh, uh, with a guy named James Cawthorn. They're like these two young guys that uh, are looking at Robert E. Howard's Conan. Oh, yeah. And say, um, you know, this guy kind of has all these very patriarchal values that kind of re reflect like U.S. cowboy movies and war movies. They're very male values. And what if we did something that was more like the James Dean version of this guy? And that's where Elric comes from. And he's like goth before goth knew it was goth. And it's this albino sword, uh, this an albino sorcerer with this sword that sucks out people's souls. And uh, you know, these days with D all the, the the things that we think about about the the um, law and chaos elements of D and D and a lot of the sort of found fundamental tenets of role playing games come from the things that he was doing in those Elric books. So we look at that. We look at the way he was influencing music at that point, where he was doing collaborations with. Hawkwind and Blue Oyster Cult on into Ooh. the 70s. 
This guy affected music. He affected role-playing games, literature on two continents, if not worldwide. So I knew this guy was a big deal. I do this cover and working with him and listening to him and having him have confidence in me, it changed everything. That was a very long-winded way of saying that this guy literally was the pivot point for my whole career. Just in the simple thing of saying, you're the artist, you figure it out. Mm-hmm. You know, I was one of those artists at that moment with my first job saying, what do you think? What, sh- what should I do with this? You know, do you have any ideas you want to give me? And I, yeah. I would even to this day, one of the biggest things I pass on, I hope to other young artists is to say, you know, when we're given a job, the more you can sort of take it upon yourself to bring the ideas to the to the thing, as opposed to asking your art director or the people around you to tell you what they want, the better the longer the career you have. Why? It's because you'll burn out. You'll have much less a chance to burn out the more you're just taking upon yourself to have the responsibility of coming up with the ideas and putting your own person into it as opposed to always going to them and saying, what do you want? Because you get tired after a while of saying, what do you want? But once you fed that at mill, they, they just kind of get used to that. You have to be the one that has to be told what to do. And Mike just set that straight from the beginning. He was like, you're the artist, you figure out, I could tell you what to do, but I'm not. And he never said I could tell you what to do. He just said, I, I still remember where I was and what the temperature of the room was and oh, nice. who was there and the dust in the air. I just remember being in his office and asking him that question and him saying, you're the artist, you figure it out. And that really did set the tone for my whole career from then on, because I really realized that it wasn't just what came out of my right hand, it was what was coming out of my head. And he wanted me to bring something fresh. It doesn't matter that I hadn't done anything before. It's like, what do you have to offer? And if you don't, get the hell out of here. I yeah. love, I love that attitude. That's you like guys tr- ever have trial like by that? fire. I, I've had to. I've had. So I'm. I'm. Um, occasionally, when he, he's really busy right now, but I mentor under um, Sean Andrew Murray um, on the Cipher World Building stuff, and Sean has. It's not so like trial by fire to say, but Sean does have a way of teaching where. He won't tell you exactly what to do. He'll just yeah. ask the right questions to kind of get you there. Like, why did you decide to do this? And then occasionally he'll say, he'll, he wants you to think. Like, I'll, I'll talk to him about my world building. I'll be like, I want to put this character in this scenario. And here's this thumbnail that I did for the piece. And he'll be like, well, it has to say more. And he won't tell you what that more is, right? Like... The last piece that I worked on was, it's very, it's just in my head, in my head, I was like, this is basic. It's a ship flying through a nebula, nothing crazy. But then he's like, it doesn't, it doesn't read like a story. Like, sure, you've got a nebula and you've got a ship, but then what else? What does it say? What's the mood? You're not setting. So he'll ask you the right questions to get your brain flowing, but he never will say, you should put asteroids. It's, I basically put asteroids in the foreground and it gave it a little more depth, right? But he never outright said, put some asteroids here, put a space station here, right? He's always like, figure, yeah. you, know, you you do the work because that's how you're, I get it now. But initially when I was first learning from him, I was like, teach me. Like, I don't understand what I'm doing wrong, right? Um, I also, you know, I mentored under Ron Lemon too and it was a little bit of the same. Like he, they want you to like learn. They want you to, you get your brain flowing enough and, and I'll admit, I still screw that up all the time. I, I constantly make pieces. I'm lucky enough to be in a, with a group of, you know, Scott Fisher has a, we, we created a Discord called the Rusty Skillet, where if you were in his class, you're in the group. And Andrew is in that group. And, you know, we're all in there. And we have a crit group where we just you drop. Was never in the class. <laughs> yeah. Well, you're, you're a special scenario. Don't everybody think you can I get know. in. <laughs> like, yeah, Andrew's a special scenario. You shouldn't have said that out loud, but he did. And it's live. Um, but, you know, like, we're lucky enough. We have like, I'm lucky enough. I feel like I've got a group of friends now where I can send them John yourself. I've sent you pieces to look at where somebody has looked at it and just either a given me some form of advice or B just kind of ask the right questions with, which you initially would look at. I would look at and say, that's not really the advice I was looking for. But if I really sat down and thought about it, it was good advice. It's the right questions. If that makes sense. I think those are good friends, honestly, who, who can do that for you, you know, put the questions out there as opposed to putting answers upon you. I mean, in the end, I mean, I, I posted something yesterday on Twitter. Um, it was something about Bosch or Hieronymus Bosch. Um, mm. yeah, what are we talking about? A guy who was born in around 1450. I don't think anybody really knows when he was born, 
Well, we know he died about 1516. So, you know, way over 500 years ago. And yet you look at his fantasy paintings or fantasy paintings. Look at his paintings. Yeah, his paintings. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't know what fantasy was yet. <laughs> well, he's doing it. You know, he's doing what we now in contemporary times yeah. or yeah, yeah. time, or fantasy. And his stuff is still weirder than almost any concept artist, you know, major fantasy artist out there. I mean, go look at some yeah. of this. Um, I posted this picture yesterday of like this bird creature with swallowing a human being with its ass up with birds flying out of yeah. the guy's ass. You know, and, and this is probably done in the early 1500s. And and it's immaculately painted. It's gorgeous, you know. And um, I guess, what, what's my point of bringing that up? I had a point here, and I just, I just lost it here. Uh, but basically, uh, you know, it's the idea of, oh, I know what I said. So there was a there was a writer named Cat Howard, phenomenal writer, who came in and said, you know, uh, something about I always tell myself when I'm doing a manuscript, add a little bit, you know, I put little notes in my manuscript to myself. She said, and I often find myself saying, make it weirder, add more weird. And I said a comment, and I realize now that I don't think I've ever quite articulated this this way before. To get something to be weirder, you have to make it more personal. Yeah. And I just typed it very quickly i didn't read huh. again like you do with twitter where you're just answering a friend um but that's like something i would usually say in a direct message not out in public but there yeah. it was and i realize now that yeah that is really it you know and i think i've always understood that that you know when i look at your work when i look at i'm gonna get his name wrong what is it bruce bernays bernays uh, Ber Ber oh bernays yeah. I mean, i'm just yeah. pulling him out because i've said i've said this to him I think his best stuff is his weirdest stuff, and and I feel like that a lot about a lot of the artists I love. Um, that you know, when it the, the more personal it gets, the the more I like it, and usually that means the stuff gets weirder and more intense um, because it's not there to kind of please a general, you know, yep. to please everyone. And that's um, yeah. I remember when I first started, I talked to you about this at that first Spectrum that I met you at, where everyone like people were like, I had people telling me stuff like, "This stuff's not going to fly. Look, it's too." out there it's too uh not fully completed to them you know whatever and i was always like this is the only way i know how to create art right now and this is the only way i'm gonna i'm not gonna change i did initially uh, there was a moment where i thought i would study harder and level up my rendering and all this stuff but then i was like why are you doing that because then it's no longer your style right and, yeah um but I like, like I, I, yeah there's something you know very sort of impressionistic and expressionistic about not just the way you're you're building shapes, but your color palette is very, very intense and it's very personal and unique. And, and you know, I, yeah. I don't think those are defects. Those I think you're recognizing that those are strengths. And yeah, we all of us have to refine our game. Yeah. But, um, you know. Yeah, there's always room for growth, right? Well, yeah. I mean, that's all this is. <laughs> yeah. You're constantly <laughs> learning. I learned something new about Photoshop last week and I'm just like, I'm going to see where I can use that somewhere someday. Well, Oh yeah, well, that was yeah. I remember that when you when that was shared uh, within the Discord group, right? Was yeah, that when it was. Yeah, I remember um, talking about like how like you know making it your own thing kind of thing. I, I remember like I used to lament about not being able to like paint like a lot of artists that I do know in terms of how they can render and all that. And over time, I just kind of realized like I I really can't think in painting in terms of like mass and tone and that kind of thing at least like you know in the way that like greg manchester or even someone like james gurney does where they know how to like model the form like that and express that through paint like i just don't have that ability but i realized over time that at least for me like the things that i prefer is like i prefer drawing and i prefer to see the drawing show through the finish as much as much as i can even that means i have to bring the drawing back into it after I laid on some paint. And it's funny because like, I don't call my, like I don't consider myself a painter, but I get painted looks here and there from that method. And it's an, my own like weird twisty way just from me kind of figuring things out here and there since I, I've I, like my painting educate, like I went to college for comics hmm. and Right when I left college, I was like, oh, I don't know if I want to do comics. <laughs> right. But I want to paint. Like, I want to, like, illustrate stuff. And since then, I had to, like, kind of pick it up and cobble it together in all different ways to get to my thing, which 
I'm kind of thankful for it now because it does give me like a unique perspective, even though like I know early on I was frustrated with the fact that there were certain things I just couldn't grok and get to mesh well in my head, even though like I knew the concepts, but I didn't know the concepts kind of thing. Yeah. So, yeah, no, I, I think that um, there are structural things. There are basic fundamental things that we have to know about art uh, yeah. to communicate effectively. But I, I, the, the further I've gone along, the more I've recognized that, I mean, sometimes the most well-rounded artists, the ones that seem to have a grasp on all, I guess, sense, contemporary sensibilities about how you tell a story, sometimes are the most boring to me, I'll be honest. And sometimes are the most static. And, and they're the ones that are the most put together, the most, you know, all the corners are kind of sanded. Yeah, oh, it's it's yeah. just got it all hemmed in just right, and everything's just nice and tight. And, you know, they get all the love, and they get very recognized. And when it comes down to their actual ideas and their their stuff, I just find it to be a bit of a dry well, honestly. And, yeah. and yet you admire, you know, the, the craft and the, the ability. I mean, there's nothing, no, no disrespect, but I just, just for me, as far as my... Yeah, you want you want that yeah. extra, right? You want that little. I mean, just, and again, it comes back to that thing about being personal. So yeah, yeah. And so I, I kind of detoured there with Morcock, but basically, that cover um, launched me into five or six years of suffering, and I think we all have to go through this as <laughs> artists. Uh, everybody out there who's looking at this, who's either aspiring to a career or is building it, or is well down the road of being a, a successful artist. Um, you know, it was knocking on doors and being told no and being rejected and constantly working on my portfolio and trying to improve it. And and I guess with me, um, I think these days I find artists seem to be, I think, more resourceful than than artists were 20 years ago about how to put your work in front of people. I don't think, obviously, we didn't have the internet at that point. I mean, point it's a little bit, little bit easier, a little bit. Yeah, but I think you also have more noise than I had to deal yeah. with. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, very high so I, to signal ratio. Yeah, there was a lot less of it back then for me. So um, I was able to get my stuff in front of people who are giving paying jobs, maybe a little faster than some people now might be able to. Um, sure. But I think you can grow an audience faster now than what I was able to back then. I never really worried about growing the audience. Yeah, I, yeah, I still don't. I'll be honest. I mean, it's my followers. Hell, I don't care. It's still it's. Audience, I still, you know, I'm always, I used to always be like, you need to build the audience, you need 10,000 followers, do X and blah, blah, blah. But I'm learning that audience is not, it's not your numbers. Like, like it's commitment. It's commitment. Yeah. You just got to do the work and then put yourself out there. And then your fan base or your, your whoever loves your work will, it, it will always either find you or just be there. Like I've, so I've done a lot of shows and I've built a lot of a mailing list from that. But if you look at my, like, Twitter or my Instagram, I think I have like maybe 3,000 followers, which maybe five years ago, I'd be like, oh shit, 3,000 followers, this is amazing. And now I'm just kind of like, that's cool. I'm glad that I have followers, better than zero. But I used to try to achieve this, you know, I had even up until like maybe three months ago, I was talking to Andrew, I was trying to get to 10,000 followers. But my goal there was on Instagram, if you get 10,000, then in your stories, you can drop a link, right, to stuff so people can come to you directly. But I've realized that the struggle of trying to get to 10,000 is really hard because you're out there with thousands of other artists who are doing the same thing you're trying to do. So Yeah, it, it, and it's I know it's easier if, uh, you know, kind of like what, what you were saying, John, earlier, like if you kind of cater to fan whims, so to speak, like, you know, have certain popular characters for illustrating. Huh? <laughs> I'm not interested in that. Yeah. 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 Same. But, but it, it gives you a unique voice, but it does make the slog a little harder to get to those same numbers that someone else may have gotten to much easier, like on a faster route as a result. But I don't know, like, like I'm sure both of you would agree that it's more rewarding because you kind of look back and you're like, yeah, I built this from like absolutely nothing. Yeah. So, and I mean, I still have the, I mean, I'm not, I'm not knocking my 3000 followers in any way. I'm still happy that people, Oh, yeah. watch my stuff and, and look at it and it'd be amazing if someday i hit ten thousand. but I'm, I'm just gonna keep at my own pace like i was rushing things i was trying to like 
you know, do things a lot faster. I was like, I need to learn Blender. And you and I, Andrew and I are, will occasionally get together and work on Blender, but I'm doing it at my own pace now. I'm not speeding through anything. And I was willing to take all these like, you know, board game, like all these board game companies asked me to do work for them. And I took, I did three of them. And then after those three, I was burnt out. I was just like, I'm not sure this is what I want to do. I'd prefer to work on my own thing, right? Like I enjoyed the work, but at the same time, I also didn't enjoy it, right? Because there was a moment where you're just like, I'm making all this art, but it's not for my own stuff. It's for somebody else's stuff, you know? Yeah. Um, I'm all for connecting with people. I mean, if people, you know, need to reach me, people know how to get to me if they need to and and, and vice versa. And I'm, I'm fine with all of it. I'm not here to put, put down social media or connecting with an audience. But what I'm saying is, I think, I didn't have to worry coming into the business about constantly comparing myself to everybody else. And now that does mm-hmm. seem to be the reality of everyone yeah. constantly comparing yourself. And I would say that far too much time is wasted, not just in the art community, but just in general of people constantly comparing themselves to other people. And there's a real high school cafeteria mentality of comparing your following to somebody else's and then sort of trying to get your following higher so that the right click of people will think you're worth no, uh, any sort of human attention whatsoever sure. you know, yeah. and I, I just never bought in and I just don't care I really don't I, and uh, I, I found that to be hard to swallow when I first started using social media about a decade ago and I'm, I'm, I'm no different now I just honestly don't care I, I really find that I think really, it's a healthier perspective yeah that's I was gonna say that's a healthier attitude to have about how you handle those things go to 150,000 person San Diego Comic Con show, right? You know, and I went to that show when I was first starting out in the business during those early days, um, hustling my portfolio just like anybody else, like tons of us have, right? And yeah, uh, I've hawked my portfolio to San Diego. I do it every time I'm there. <laughs> sure. And so, you know, all those years, it finally built up to 2014, where I was actually asked to be one of their big, you know, guests. And I'm not a huge name, but in that place, you know, one of the most important things, I, I forget which pro told me this, but they said, don't worry about trying to get the attention of everybody. Just find the people that care about your stuff. And exactly. Really work hard to just try to make sure that those people know you're going to be there and that you'll have um, an experience of value to give them. It was really sage wisdom. I wish I could remember who said that, but it wasn't me. It was that was given to me, and it it, it chilled me out. Uh, it, you know, because that show, I was that opportunity. I was very keyed up about it, and I, that, I think that kind of mentality. Every once in a while, all of us need that reminder of just. Look, just find your own crowd. And I, mean, I don't mean just as far yeah. as your friends. I mean, as far as your audience. Yeah. Um, and just stick to the work that you really feel passionate about. I mean, all these years, I've done all this look, um, this this cover stuff, right? Um, working as a gun for hire for like Random House, for Simon Schuster, for Harper Collins, for Tor. Love it, man. I, I love the sort of that that sprinter mentality of going through a sprint and then reaching the finish line and going to the next sprint. And I did that for years and years and years, and I still take on covers, although right now I'm in kind of a special period, and I can go into that after a while. But um, I I don't know how many covers I've done at this point. It's probably somewhere around whew, 300, 350. Damn. <laughs> wow. Uh, and I'm talking I... about just book covers. Then we start throwing magazines in there. It's it's a lot, you know, but you know, a lot, even the magazine stuff, it's not stuff that necessarily is from the science fiction fantasy world. You know, I that's another clue i'll give to people and i don't even know if we ha- we don't even have a magazine market anymore the way it, the not, way it was terrible. no everything's digital like it's it's there's still food. valid building a portfolio you know those digital venues they're more um mm. they're more of them and they're more valid than ever before and it's going to just stay that way you know uncanny magazine um is one is a really good one Clark, uh, clark's world um i'm just talking in the sff world um yeah the uh what's the one what's that one i'm thinking of um I mean, I've sent stuff in that As- Asimov's sci-fi that yeah. still exists. I think it still exists in paper form. Um, yeah, it definitely does. Um, Imagine, Imagine FX is one I still have, but I get that digitally now because space. I don't even know. I was going to say, do they even do a physical? They do. Anymore? They'll send you a physical. I had it for a number of years, but once uh, my baby was born, my wife was like, "These mag- there's stacks of magazines. Because you don't exactly sit and read them all in one go. You pile them up and get to them when you get yeah. to them. So. Yeah. But I mean, I'm just saying in terms of storytelling magazines where you can flex your muscles. But what I was going to say is my advice is that I found that I would get these um, opportunities from things as 
as crazy as like Texas Parks and Wildlife magazine, you nice. know, where they would say, we have this uh, story on fire ants and we need a, we need a piece in the next 10 days. And I'm yeah. talking about my early days, I would get right. these opportunities from these really obscure magazines when I was kind of sending out my little postcards everywhere. And in the end, what I would do is I would always make it something that was maybe more fantastical than what the art director had first come to me for. And that voicing always seemed to play well. It never, I, I, I never got a response of, um, that's too weird. Or it, you, you'll be surprised. I think the more personal um, investment, and I mean personal in terms of your own quirks and your own way of seeing the yeah. world, thing of taking out your eyeballs and handing them to someone and saying, Here's how I see it, and yeah, and first you have to have a take, don't you? And so, I, I I can't quite, you know, that whole where do ideas come from thing. I mean, they come from everything you see around you. They come from the, your influences, of course. But I think how you process those things. I don't think enough of that is talked about. How you process those things, and whatever that is, um, I seem to have a lot of confidence in that early on. And maybe that was because of Moorcock saying it was okay to to put myself out there. But um, there's always a lot of that in my cover work, even though if, if it's not a, I always say that the art has to be about the story that's between the covers and that's our mission, right? But w the way I look at it with, with a cover is I always say, it's like you're introducing a friend to friends. That, that book, that story that you're entrusted with, that novel or that anthology or collection that your cover is gonna be on, think about that collection of words as a friend that you're saying to a bunch of friends out there, Hey, this is this this stuff's pretty cool. You ought to check it out. And when you're introducing, like, if I to introduce Alan to some friends, I'm not going to tell him two or things about two or three things about Alan that annoy me. I'm going to say two or three things about Alan that I hope will impress okay. them. Say, oh, this guy's cool. I'd like to know who he is. And that's what you do with a piece of cover art. You're basically looking at the story and on your own terms, as a friend, you're looking at that story and saying, "Here's some of the things that turn me on about this thing," and you're trying to project that through the art. And there's a billion ways to do that and then some, you know, and it's, and it, but it always comes back to how you as an artist, as a visual artist, are filtering that story. And that approach, I don't know, it took me a lot of years to articulate it in that very basic way. But that's the way I approach covers. I mean, and I, it's always about the story. The story is God. But in the end, also, there's always some of me. And sometimes there's a lot of me in those covers. Yeah. But it's underneath. It's, un it's in the subtext of the piece. It's never out front because the cover's not about me. It covers about that story. But the stuff that, like, for instance... Um, I, I was going to ask, like, do you yeah, feel that way? Um, do you feel that way with your uh, card collection that you're working on as well now? Like, do you... I, I know that you're basically taking a existing card game and putting your own spin on it. How much of it is you and how much of it is the card, the, the, the original basis of the cards coming through in those illustrations? 98% me, 2% card. I mean, <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, so it's actually like you would, would you consider that like the flip of what the book covers are where you, you it's don't the try same. and it's okay. the same. It's just look at is, is that same mentality on steroids. You know I mean? It's, gotcha. That's what I'm trying to impart to people that your personal work and your professional work, they both need to be personal. The more powerful work out there in that quote unquote commercial realm, <clears throat> The more personal it is, the more effective it is, period. And I'll, I'll, I'll fight anybody who wants to contend with that. I mean, the more powerful, the more resonant stuff, it's going to be because it's more personal and you put more of your personal vision into it. And those things connect with people. Um, and I find that people who just say, you know, well, these, these two things are very separate. Be careful. I think, you're, I think you could be um, setting yourself up. In fact, I, I do think people set themselves up when they think that way. But there, you know, I do have sort of a body of quote unquote commercial work that is published by big time publishers. And then what you're referring to is what's kind of come in the, the latter part of this last 25 years, which is me creating an imprint called Lone Boy, where mm -hmm. I um, start to do my own projects that are sort of my own IP, much like Alan has his with um, Ancient Ones. And, you know, I basically what happened is I won a Hugo Award, which for people who don't know what those are, they're like these like the Oscars for science fiction, but it's like a very sort of, like all these awards, like Spectrum, Chesley's, Locus, these are all just little fiefdoms of, of people, cliques who sort of say, yeah. this is what we think are the special things or the things that we like most. Hugo's are no different. It's just, it's one community. And all of these communities I, I think of as equals. They, they all have their own um, sensibilities. 
And I never think of one as, you know, the one ring that rules them all. There is no one special award. No, uh, no. Yeah. Are, are a wonderful thing. And that literary community and that arts community, um, I guess, kind of saw my work as early as 2005, where they thought, oh, there's, maybe there's something going on with this guy. So I kept getting nominated for this award. And I was like, um, I was like the biggest loser. Like every year I would lose. I mean, and I would lose to great people like Michael Whalen. Uh, Jim Burns, Stefan Martinier, uh, Sean Tan. Um, that's a great list of people I lost to. And they yeah. all served it more than me, probably. But I was building, paying my dues, so to speak. So I think it took me eight years before I finally won my first Hugo in 2012. The reason nice. I bring up that, that Hugo, though, is that was a pivot point. Because at that point, I could continue <laughs> being that same guy that kept winning those things and just keep racking those up. Or I could say, well, people are looking at me kind of just a little more special right now because of this little piece of hardware. Maybe I ought to take that door, push it open, and see if now I could do something that I wasn't able to do before I won this thing. So what does that mean? That usually means creating your own stuff. Yep. And that's a risk. And that's a huge yeah. risk. You finally reach something where people are looking at you as like, well, you're on top of the mountain. Well, the natural inclination is to stay on top of the mountain. But I kind of went the other way. And I said okay, this is great, but I don't want to keep being this same guy over and over and over. I want to start building my own stuff. Um, and I think all of us come to those pivot points and, and they, those pivots come in different forms, but that was one of mine. That was a real moment. And so I created Lone Boy and started, basic Loteria cards are what happen in my spare moments. And as people have been collecting and they realize my spare moments are not enough because <laughs> that series has taken me forever. But there are 54 cards in the series, and I do intend to finish this thing, and it'll happen. I know. How many like, do you have now? We're like at 24 or 25. Like I literally, literally have some. Oh man, but you got time. Out, yeah, no, I'm gonna get it. I'll get it. And there's a story that started to attach itself to these things. Where by the fourth image, I realized I was telling a story to myself like a lullaby, mm -hmm. and I, I thought to myself, well, you know, maybe I'll write this down. But I was too chicken to want to think of it as an actual story. I just thought it was a series of images, but I thought, well, these, these little story prompts maybe might help me as I go along. And then I showed it to a couple of friends, really close friends, and told them, you know, don't show anybody, don't laugh, but, you know, here's, here's some stuff I'm writing. And they said, uh, have you thought about um, putting this together into a book? And I was like, well, the images, yeah, but not the writing. And they said, yeah, you really ought to think about putting those two things together, because this stuff's actually pretty good. I didn't really believe them, so I started. I, I kept working on the stuff, but then showed it to a, an editor or two, and they said the same thing. And so eventually, in 2016, I got an agent, and a, a literary agent, I should say. I don't. Mm -hmm. I still to this day don't have an art agent, and don't really plan to either. But uh, but as a a guy who realized, hey, I think I want to be a writer artist at some point, and actually um, tell tell stories that combine words and pictures. Uh, I, I need to. I need to have someone who can help me navigate those waters. And so a literary agent, I think, is a must if you're going to be an author. And uh, that's what I fully intend to do. Is I, I still love being a gun for hire as a cover artist. Again, doing it for 25 years, it's been great. I don't intend to stop. But what I have done, you know, I alluded to earlier, was that I'm kind of at a special moment where I literally, and this has been terrifying, have turned off the faucet. And it took me a year and a half to slowly whittle down my cover art to where now I have none. I have zero covers on my docket oh, at this wow. point. So are you That's mainly focused on IP work now? Yeah, but there's so, I alluded to in our emails to that there were, two, basically there's two things that are gonna dominate my 2021 yep. that sadly I cannot talk about, but I'll, I'll allude right. to them. Let's not be a big tease, but I, I just, to be cool, I can't be like, you know. Right, yeah, off. yeah, I get it, trust yeah. me. I, so one of them is a children's book. Um, and I am a partner in this. I, I was something that I had in my head um, five years ago, and it's something I really wanted to do. But at that point, I'm already working on Loteria as a story. And um, I knew that Loteria is a lonely road because uh, one of the things I'm doing with Loteria is I realized that a lot of times, even as visual artists, we'll take written prompts and turn those into pictures. I mean, that's what cover art often mm -hmm. is, uh, obviously. Right. And so I realized that the joy of doing Loteria was me looking at these little, um, these little, you know, Mexican um, bingo cards that I grew up with that millions and millions and millions of Mexican and Mexicanics people have grown up with and reinterpreting them my way. And the words and the stories were coming from the images. So the, the image comes before the words. And I like that. And I think there's a real power in that. And I think there's a real lesson in that. 
so that if I could try to pull off where the words came second to the pictures, that would be something where I, I'm, I'm trying to prove to myself that I can do something effectively that way. I think a lot no, of my writing- absolutely can. That's yeah. kind of how I've been creating my last. So I started writing my second book and a lot of the stuff in it has illustrations already, ideas have already started before the writing has started. And then I'm basically going back to, I had I had a thought for this and I was like, I'm going to restart writing it. And like, But the artwork came first in this scenario. But in the first book, a lot of those stories were written years ago. So it went the opposite way, but I get what you're saying. It's the, it's a little bit of a, it's doable, but we got to see if it's doable. <laughs> you know, like, well, I just trying. It's the, what I'm trying to prove to myself is that I can do it on my terms and bring something fresh to this frontier that 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 hasn't been seen before. And so yeah. that's why I said it's lonely. It's, it's not just that process, which you know, it's well, I'm not unique in having gone down that road. There's others. I just don't know how many have done it effectively. But I think that um, the format that I'm trying to do for this book is, is a little weird. And so in that way, it was a lonely process because there's nobody I can show it to and say, what do you think? Because right. it's, it's a little odd. And I think it has to be really put together for, in, a, in a very sort of complete form, if not finished form. For somebody to be able to get it, so to speak. I mean, it's not like I'm doing House of Leaves or something, but you that's know what, what I was saying. gonna say. I'm like, have you read House of Leaves? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I think but, it's still cool if you have. I think trying, to, like, you know, I had wild ideas for my book when I designed it from the start. Like, I wanted to look old and new, like digital yet ancient. Like, I had all these wild ideas. I could not figure out how to like encompass them together in a book, right? Like. But, you know, I, I have to still send you your copy. But what I ended up creating was a, an art journal, essentially, of the traveler and his adventures. And I try, and it's, I think it turned out okay. But I still have these visions in my head where I want, like, I love the Book of Leaves because it made you, like, really, like, you have to play with the book to understand the book. And that's I think right. that's kind of a cool concept. But yeah. it's a very, um, there's only so many people that will enjoy that concept. But well, that's so not a bad thing. Yeah, uh, no, yeah, and I, I don't. Again, I don't think of it like that. I just think of like the, the piece itself. And, but it, what, I, what I was talking about is not so much about audience as much as just getting feedback. So, to get back to the children's book, I was um, I wanted somebody to be on that with me um, so that I could have company because <laughs> yeah, I sure. had the story beats worked out. I needed. I, I really yeah. actually also wanted to learn from an actual writer of someone who really um, does does that for a living. Uh, how they would see it, you know. I wanted to. I wanted to hear their voice just as much as I wanted to hear mine, maybe more than I wanted to hear mine. And so that's what I did. I went to a friend who I loved a lot and respected a lot and said, you've never done one of these before. I've never done one of these before, but I think you're one of the best writers in the world and I love you and I want to do this. And it took a while for that all to kind of connect, sure. but it's now connected in a big bad way. And I am currently working on it and, um, I guess sometime this year it gets announced, and it's it's probably one of the most significant things, if not the most significant thing, I'll I'll have done in my career to this point in terms of just the, the amount of storytelling in there and and the um, the rigor that this thing is going to demand for me for my art. Um, it's it's the best. I am so I'm having so much fun doing. Yeah, this. you have fun when you're working on your own. Like I was saying earlier, when I worked on the board game stuff, I enjoyed it, but I had more fun working on my own stuff. Yeah, I mean, so look, there's yeah, a little but, bit of freedom there, right? Well, I think for me, I'm a weirdo though, and that Loteria gives me that freedom already. I didn't need this to give me that. What I like about this is that I guess it's the pressure part. I think it's why cover art for me always was kind of fun because I didn't want to go be just a gallery artist who, you know, was going to be seen by the people in that room that walked in to see that original. And I think things are different yeah. now because there's so much more of an online presence for gallery art, but. Just going back in the day to back when I started, I mean, I, I really did want to work in a more commercial realm because I did like that whole thing of being judged by a marketplace and having to sort of compete with other stuff and having to, you know, make the grade, so to speak. Not so much to be pleasurable to people, but can your thing, can you create something that is on your terms that also serves the story that also can sell and connect with people, you know? Um, I never look at sales numbers. I'm not privy to sales numbers, but you can tell when your stuff connects when you just keep seeing the images out there on the bookstore shelves year after year after year. Yeah, you as it keeps popping. And I enjoy I enjoy that competitive aspect. So I enjoy that 
that I don't call it pressure even, but I guess that's a word that people would like to use. So the children's book, I don't need it to give me that gratification that the the Loteria and the the self-generated IP does for you. Well, I think what I do like about it is the absolute ridiculous pressure it puts upon me to be dealing with this person I'm working with and to deal with the stakes that are involved with this book. Um, and there's a cultural angle to this book as well that puts a lot of stakes on it as well. I love that stuff. I think that's why I'm just kind of on a real high right now. And, and it's it's scary. And I think that's where I'm I'm getting the most joy. I, I've, I've been I've been wanting something like this for a long time. And it's it's delivering, believe me, when it comes to what whatever you call it, whether it's stakes or pressure or I don't know, just kind of joy of the game. It's doing it for me. And then I'm also you like the challenge. Yeah. Absolutely. That's that's the that's the best stuff. It's undefinable, but I love it. Um, and I'm working on an, another project that hasn't been announced either. But basically, I'm illustrating probably one of the most significant books in the history of science fiction fantasy. And I'm getting to do my sort of take on this particular book. And uh, I wish I could talk about it. But yeah, yeah you're just going to tease us with oh. that and walk away, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's fair. Yeah, that's, that's fair. That's being published by... Um, I, uh, you know, don't don't pretty, say it. Everyone's gonna scramble to look up the publisher. <laughs> yeah, just be quiet. So yeah, I mean, and, that, and that's an interesting thing that maybe I can just allude to real quick is how you split your brain between <clears throat> two things. You know, I find maybe as I get older that I would think that I would be able to juggle better, but I feel like I'm I'm a, more effective at a lot of things. But one of them is I don't think juggling is one of them. I would say. When I was like, say, doing, um, there's a cover I post up on my Twitter and my Facebook, and I'll put again post it on Instagram after we're done with this talk. Um, it was Elric Swords and Roses, and that, when, did, when did that come out? That came out in 2010, and I know at that point, right around there, is when when I was working on that book, George R. R. Martin comes to me and says, Ooh, yeah. "I would love to see you do your take on my Song of Ice and Fire characters." And this is before there's a show called Game of Thrones. This is before HBO gets involved. This is yeah. just this author coming to me in a bar at a convention and saying, I've loved your stuff for a long time. I would love to see your take on my characters. And the smart answer to him would have been to say no. It would have been to say no. Because at that point, I was working on 13 covers all at the same time, plus <laughs> all the experience for that, that forthcoming Elric book. And I was I was really multitasking on a massive level and and not realizing that that was a special time you know i mean i had done a lot of covers in that period every year i was doing you know easily a dozen or so major published covers i'm not even talking about all the magazine stuff and all the other side stuff that it was being published in those times and now i can't i mean i'm sitting here working between these two big projects and i find it really hard to switch off you know and back in the day that didn't seem to be a problem at all and i don't know what that is because i'm more distracted by social media, even though I try to keep it at a distance. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's just getting older, but I, I don't seem to be able to switch on and switch off quite as easily. And I would say the only thing that really saves me is my sketchbook in that I really do sort of try to just lay out a schedule for myself of, okay, from here to here, we're going to work on this. And then from here to here, we're going to work on this. And even then I still bleed where it, it doesn't quite work out. One of them definitely is, is lacking. And I'll just say it right now, it's not the children's book. <laughs> it's the other one that's, uh, that's lacking in time. But business-wise, I structured it to where that one could be lacking and I wouldn't get killed. The sure. children's book was going to have to be the big horse. Um, and I knew it. So, gosh, I wish there was an answer for that. Maybe, maybe, I'll, maybe somebody out there will be able to help me figure that out. But I used to be so good at that, and I'm not as good at it anymore. <laughs> Whereas as you get older... So the other th other things preoccupy your time as you get older. It's just all it is. Maybe it's kids. Yeah, maybe maybe it's my, yeah. I'm not it my it's kid. Not, it's not necessarily <laughs> people are always like, "Is your kid taking up the bulk of time?" I'm like, I do spend a lot of time with my kid, but it's not really. It's just life. Yeah. You it's know? mental. Yeah. It's mental. It's not about the kid. It's it's mental. But anyway, there's a little confessional there for you. But yeah, I mean the yeah. the covers um, have been the love of my life, and I continue to enjoy doing them. But right now, I'm not doing any. Um, I Wait, think so there's a couple that are going to be knocking on the door because they're part of series um so you did do the cover for martin then so what happened yeah i didn't finish that story <laughs> i left you guys with a note you left us hanging man <laughs> I'll, I'll just finish that story so the, the the smart answer would have been to say no 
Um, but I said yes. And um, and the reason I said yes is just because, um, much like with the Mike Moorcock experience, where it was a guy who was sitting across from me saying, look, I really believe in what you're doing. And I wanted John Picasso. Oh, this is straight out of George's mouth, too. This was the best part. This is what sold me. He said, have you seen the Michael Comart calendar? And I was like, I know of it, but I've never seen it in the store. He's like, yeah, that's the problem. It doesn't have any distribution because because of the publishing deal that was set up for that project. But he said, this one's going to be with Random House. This is going to be with the mothership. This is going to be with my publisher. Oh. He says, I want this to be a John Picasso vision of my character. He says, I love Comark. You know, he said, and I, I, I thought Comark's work on that calendar was amazing too. Mm -hmm. but, um, but the idea that this thing was going to be out there in a big, bad way, again, this has nothing to do with the show because there is no show at that point, but that he believed in my stuff and he believed in the way I saw things and he wanted that particular sensibility to be brought to his characters. So I said yes, and it created one of the most intense years of my life where I was working on all of these covers, all of these magazines, all of these interiors, and then you throw on top of it this major calendar. Well, long story short is that I did the calendar work, um, and it came out in 2012. I think it was when well, it came out in 2011, actually. And that was right around when Game of Thrones launched. Well, what I didn't know until maybe a year after it launched was that as I was doing that artwork, that artwork was getting funneled to the people who were the producers for the show, the producers for the show, basically. Um, that wasn't part of the deal. And, and I, I have never felt bad about that in, one, in any way, shape, or form because whether it was George, I'm sure it was George, and I'm sure it, was without, it couldn't have happened without his consent. But what that said to me was that um, he, he loved my stuff so much that he wanted to help him shape not just this calendar, but some of the aesthetic of the show. So what am I saying when I say the aesthetic of the show? Well, what happened was when I saw that first episode of first season, there's a scene where the um, Baratheons are coming into Winterfell. And then there's this shot where you see all the uh, Starks lined up at Winterfell as they're about to receive yeah, the yeah. Baratheons coming in. And as they pan down uh, across the uh, line of kids, seeing Bran, seeing Arya, and especially seeing Rob. I remember watching with my wife, and we were like, that looks like my artwork. Whoa, she looks like my artwork. He looks a lot. Oh, my God, he's dead <laughs> like my artwork. And we both were just like, well, we, we were all looking at the same source material. We didn't really think that much of it. But as time went along, I realized, yeah, I think they were looking at my stuff. And then it really ended up, two years later at a Worldcon where I actually met the producers and they came and told me, yeah, we, we've been looking at your stuff since casting. Um, oh, wow. At the actor who played Bran Stark, I guess it was two years ago. He was at a show here in San Antonio and um, he came up to me and said, you're the guy that changed my life. And I was like, all right, tell me this story. How does this work? <laughs> he said that, yeah, your artwork that you did for that calendar, it was gigantic in the casting trailer when we were all auditioning for the Bran Stark role. And I was really nervous and I was holding my mom's hand and I looked at your artwork and I said, mom, it looks just like me. I think I've got it. And he mm -hmm. said, you know, I looked at that thing and it just calmed me down because no other kid in line looked like that face. And he said, somehow you nailed me before I was even, you know, in, in the role. And uh, <laughs> I think it's all a little bit BS there. I mean, not, I'm not giving you BS. I'm just I saying. mean, I'm looking at the artwork right now. It's, 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 pretty, it's pretty accurate. I, oh, I don't know. Look at that kid. Look at um, Isaac when he first starts. Out. Actually, you know, the real teller is not even remember how young these kids are right when they start. So if you look at like the photos when they are announced, not just when they're in the role, but when they're announced. Yeah. Yeah. That's where you. Oh, yeah. That there was like, oh, yeah, there's some real resemblance, especially look at the cat who played Rob Stark. Was it Richard Madsen? I believe. Yeah, I that's, believe that's his name. They look a lot like my art. And so. Whatever, man. I don't. I don't get caught up. I mean, it, it was very nice that it had a bit of a influence, but it wasn't intended that way. It wasn't like I worked for the show, um, and I never consider myself a Game of Thrones artist. I'm not. Um, I was there to serve the literary property, but I, I say all that to just to say that, you know, for artists out there, I mean, <laughs> you never know what's going to happen with the stuff that we're doing. You know, no and, joke. And as we see. Um, What's happening with, uh, gosh, I just blanked out. What, what the, the big controversy that we've got going on with uh, crypto. Oh, crypto, the yeah, NFTs. Crypto art and everything. Yeah. 
I just blanked out. That's lack of sleep there for you right there. Um, NFTs, you know, really, really pay attention to the rights for your work. Um, I was very fortunate that George and I had a, a friendship and he basically said, look, whatever you do with this artwork, you have my permission to make money on it after we're done here, after the calendar's out of print. The characters remain my, remain my trademark, but the artwork is your copyright and you own that, that work and you can do whatever you want with it. Um, but just as long as we honor our agreement with the publisher first, make sure they get all the money they can make off this calendar and then do whatever you're going to do. And, um, I, you know, except for Star Trek, except for X-Men, maybe a couple of other things. I pretty much held on to the copyright on every single piece I've ever done as far as cover art and magazine work. Right. And that's a really, I'm finding more and more that that doesn't happen a lot for artists. Um, because I think a lot of the stuff artists do these days are work for higher things. And that's the trade-off, right? I'm, I'm not going to bag on people who have built their entire career on that stuff. But it does make it hard to have those revenue streams. And I, I find, later in life, I should say, to have those revenue streams. And um, with NFTs, it's a very interesting world, isn't it? You know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not even a novice with NFTs. I, I don't have much um, experience with this stuff at all. But I would say that I am hearing that there are contracts being put out by certain publishers, let's just say, who yeah. want to have the rights to your work so that they, if they want to put out NFTs using your artwork, they will have the legal right. I would yeah. say to art very careful about that. Um, I don't have much experience in this realm, but I do have enough experience with our business to know that that's something you need to be very careful with about giving your rights away in those in those milieus. Um, so yeah, just watch out out there when it, when it comes to those clauses. Because um, owning the rights to your work as much as, as you can, again, this is usually for stuff that's non-work for hire. Um, the more you can be owning those rights, the better. Yeah. It just it really does help. <clears throat> I've heard a lot of stories about artists who yeah. give away their work and then there's like, I kind of wish I kept some of my rights on that. It's like, yeah, there's that music comic again. Industry is right with that. I apologize Stop. for the weird music that's playing right now. I don't know why my system keeps doing that. Yeah, not, not hearing it. It might just be on your end. It literally yeah. was a, <laughs> I I'm watching. Hear. It was like a 15 second disco song. Something's yeah, I running. <laughs> I don't know. No, I mean, um, my guess, uh, people watching heard it. I don't know what the hell that was. It's, it's okay. So, I mean, I apologize. Sorry. It, it might, it might be computer audio or something on your end that is getting captured through Streamlabs. Yeah. Something is it? Happening. Is it good at least? It's not bad. It's just so <laughs> random and and creepy. Like I'm being hacked all of a sudden. You know, like it's definitely got a very synthwave sound to it. Um, well, we're a little bit over an hour, which is not a problem, but I wanted to address a couple of other things that, you know, we, we, we went back and forth on in emails and you are actually having a 25th anniversary event. You said um, that you're going to extend till the 30th of June. Yeah. What is today? Today's the 26th. Today is the 26th. So yeah, I basically for this entire month have been kind of, like I said, kind of looking back at the last 25 years and putting up these posts on social media, just kind of talking about covers and answering questions about them. Um, yeah, and so while I was doing that, I thought, you know, I, I never do, I, like I like to do when I do conventions and go on the road, I'll give little discounts on my merchandise. And I never do that online. And certainly during the pandemic, I mean, I think a lot of artists can relate to this. Our websites ended up being our lifeline. So mm -hmm. I wasn't doing a lot of discounting during the pandemic. What I did do, do, what I did do during the pandemic was I created a mask. I don't know if you guys saw it where I took Oh, yeah, the, the Calavera mask, yeah. Calavera and turn it into a mask. And that thing, whoo, my God, people bought that, bought the hell out of that thing, which was amazing. But that, I think that's the most I've ever really merchandised. That's the most merchandise I've ever moved through my website in one push. Nice. Uh, because I don't really discount a lot. So I thought, well, for the 25th anniversary, why don't we give like a 25% discount on all of the uh, deluxe art prints of my, not just my cover art, but my Loteria art and my... Song of Ice and Fire art, and so I was kind of staging it across the month where I was different categories were getting a 25% discount. And so for these last few days of the month, I decided well, we'll just in, open up the entire category, all deluxe art prints, just make them all 25% till the 30th, and then after that, go back to retail. And um, yeah, my prints are printed on some you know really nice Somerset velvet, and we, we print them here in the studio. 
uh, on, on our big Epson and I sign them up and the, so the uh, Song of Ice and Fires are signed and numbered. And um, yeah, yeah, we, we, we uh, will have those. I'll drop, a, I'll drop a link to the store in, after the video too. So people yeah. can get to that. What I like too has been able to be sort of dialoguing with people about, it's funny, I, I got a comment, I got comments from like, a comment from Greg Ruth yesterday was very indicative of some of the comments that have really made me happy this month. It's not so much people liking the stuff as much as people who said, I had no idea you did that cover. And, and yeah. it's not because it doesn't look like my style or it doesn't look like my aesthetic. It's just, it's that thing of building a body of work over a lot of years. And after a while, people just lose track of what you've done. And in a way, I kind of like that because I don't really want to, again, look back at what I've done. But at, at certain point, maybe there's an art book or something that happens. There was an art book of my stuff that came out. Gee whiz, how long ago was that? 15 years ago, I think. It was an early art book. So I guess at this point, there's time to do one in the next few years. Um, but yeah, I think getting to start to see that there's a body of, there's such a large body of work that people have lost track of some of the things I've done, like Canical for Leibowitz or Gateway, which I'm tired of. I've, I've seen those things a billion times. I would think everybody has. But yeah, Greg says, I've, I've had this book forever. I didn't realize that was yours. I love when people say stuff like that. That's, That's cool. funny. I, I ran it. I remember the first time I, on a quick side note, met Greg Ruth was at San Diego my first year there. And I met him in an elevator. I just happened to know what he looked like, right? And I'm just like, are you Greg Ruth? And he had this look like, is this kid about to rob me? <laughs> you know, like, I was just like, dude, I just love your work. I just recognize your face, you know? Um, he's a sweet guy. And he's one of my favorites. I mean, my medium as you know, a lot of people probably know is it's mostly graph. It's basically big graphite drawings that I then digitally um, augment in, in Photoshop. You know that I, my digital color is basically all Photoshop, and I mm -hmm. use it like a caveman. I'm not. I'm not. Uh, I'm not spending all my time building a digital file. I'm, I'm really spending most of my time on that big graphite drawing. And Greg's graphite work is God. It's just so. Yeah, it's favorite. so good. Yeah, so it's ridiculously it's good. So inspiring. So. Yeah, no, I'm, 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 that's that's what's going on right now. There's lots and lots of graphite all over the floor in my studio and working on those two projects. And hopefully hopefully by fall, at least one of them, if not both of them, will get to be announced. But, um, are you thinking about, um, I was going to ask you, you are talking about the, the book stuff. Are you thinking about kickstarting any of that? Which one? The children's book, for example. The children's book, oh, I can't even say this. Um, it, it's It's sold. Oh, you don't have to talk about it if you can. It's fine. You yeah, can just say no. I, I, well, <laughs> yeah. I give details about it, but it, believe me, it's taken care of. Oh, oh, good. That's good. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I, 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 I was going to try to get a publisher. That children's book is not going to be self-published. Let me just put it that way. Yeah, I'm learning right now that self, like, so I self-published in it because when I, you know, I talked to a, a couple friends in the industry who said, you know, I try to get see if they would publish it for me. Um, but then I was told, get it, get a Kickstarter, show that it's popular and then we can help publish it from there. You know, we've moved forward with that from there. So I'm, now I'm reaching out to them to say, what are the chances you guys can print the rest of these and sell them? Because I'm tired. I like self-publishing is a, it's like, I am sitting on 800 copies. I have to sell still. Right. Which one yeah. show startup, I think I'll be fine. But what if I didn't have a show to go to? Right. Like what yeah. if that that element doesn't exist like i don't know what it's going to be like in september they might cancel shows again so yeah. it'd be nice if somebody else was doing that heavy lifting for me it i learned a lot in the process where I, for the second book i'm like maybe i should see if i can find somebody to self-publish this thing because or publish it for me because it's a lot of work um and a lot of people they have to deal with right i had a writer i had some writers who were um helping me bring the stuff i had already you know, I had all these notes of stories. I had writers help me bring those to life. Then I had an editor. Then I had a designer, you know, and then I had uh, another designer to help me clean stuff up, right? I have a graphic design degree. Everyone's like, you're a graphic designer. Why don't you just design your own book? I'm like, I have a, I did a lot of web at web graphics, um, front end development. So a book is a completely different beast. Like just because you can do graphics in one area doesn't mean you can do graphics in all areas, if that makes sense, you know? You probably can. Well, that's that's maybe where the architecture thing kind of saved me is I always just looked at everything as problem solving. Yeah. You know, Again, it's I mean, that stupid something mentality. Well, I can build a house. Why can't I build a book? You like, Yeah, you like that challenge. Whereas I was sitting here like, I'm going to design this book like garbage. 
I had the, <laughs> I did the root, you know, the basic idea of the layouts and stuff. I, 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 I had down pretty well, but it's that extra refining that I had to bring in that designer to be like, look this over, and you add your, Absolutely. you know, spice to it. Yeah. But um, I'm not saying I can do everything, but I mean. I'll, I'll take on anything, but yeah, learning off those people is always great. Um, I, I want to just say self-publishing, I still absolutely believe in that as a valid conduit for getting work out there. I mean, oh, it's totally, yeah. I'm doing that with the Loteria cards. I mean, that's the same thing that you just said. I'm using the Loteria Grande cards and my posters to build my audience. So that eventually when the Loteria book comes out through a major publisher, an audience has been built. Yeah. Um, the children's book, that that doesn't have to worry about that. Um, That's good. Yeah, I mean, like my book. Uh, the only I I honestly feel like the only reason I was able to kickstart it and it was successful was from the the people that like my work, right? Like my mailing list and my Twitter account, my Instagram account. All those people are the people that saw the work and then eventually when they were always bugging me, when's the book coming out? When's the book coming out? And when I finally put it out, they delivered. I put it out there thinking you know i had that mentality where like i'm like these people are just asking for this thing i'm gonna do it and it's not gonna be successful but it funded you know and i was just like oh okay you know like nah, I, nah, I, that, that actually happened i didn't expect i'll be honest i, I kick-started in the middle of a pandemic i didn't expect it to to actually yeah. happen right um yeah that's great so and then that's you learn great. a lot of lessons on what you could have done better to maybe i probably could have done a little better if i promoted it harder or whatever there's always what ifs right there's all these what ifs so yeah but each, each block builds upon the, the block before yep. so now i know good. like i have a i actually have a list here on my wall of things to do for the second book right like my editor and i went through she's one of my really good friends and she's like here's all the things we did wrong and here's all the things we did right yeah. so let's try yeah. to eliminate that wrong list on the next round you know andrew yeah. knows a lot of these stories <laughs> um yeah, that's <laughs> but since we're a little over time now um is there um anything we didn't talk about that you really wanted to talk about i think we hit all your talking points oh we hit whatever you want to talk about i yeah. mean there's always the hikonics initiative but that's a whole half hour if not longer i mean i, I mean we can have you on again to talk about that if you want to yeah yeah i don't i think i think this has been a good session i yeah. i will say just shout out to a lot of those artists that were because i was an initiative created three years ago that brought in a lot of Mexican American and Mexican uh, creators into the science fiction fantasy scene. Some of them were already in the scene, but not in a very prominent way. And, you know, since I think probably a lot of the audience for this is, is the visual community, in fact, probably all of it at this point, would you say, Alan, probably? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Most of them totally. Visually. Yeah. So, I mean, there's people like Dianita, who I think uh, her name is Dianita Ceron, but she goes by Dianita. She's been watching uh, the whole time. Rising up. Um, oh, she's around? She's been watching hey, the whole up? show. Yeah. Okay, cool. There, there you go. My people are out there. Uh, <laughs> um, Gary Villarreal, who goes by Viarte on Instagram. That guy is a monster. Again, another guy along with Greg Ruth, who I absolutely love his graphite skills. Um, and, you know, you're talking about a guy who really, for me, is living that life of everything he does is personal, at least in the stuff he puts out there on Instagram. You know, it's, it's a vision, a very story driven vision but it's very much the stuff that he's seeing and like he's pulling out his eyeballs and handing them to us and saying here's yeah. how i see the world and god he's phenomenal so gary Villarreal, dianita um lauren snow is is coming up i mean it's interesting lauren's interesting in that she's i, I think she will have a career as an illustrator but her design chops uh have kind of taken the forge where she's already become sif was art director and she's the art director for the science fiction writers of america and so Oh, that, wow. I, wow. that I didn't see coming when I picked her for the initiative. Um, there's Babs Webb, who's amazing. Another oh, I know. Artist. I love Babs' work. She's such uh, a nice person, Babs. too. She's phenomenal. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's just there's a number of visual artists that I'm very inspired by and proud to walk with them and march with them. You know, we, we realize that there's not many of us in this field who are, um, at least in the professional end of the field, who are of Mexicanics extraction and uh, or of Mex Mexicanics extraction heritage i should say mm -hmm. um and we kind of uh have bonded as, as a bit of a family and that's so cool. always reading people and it's not just visual people it's authors and editors but again i got to call out a few of those uh visual folk and i'm sure there's a few that i'm i'm leaving off and they'll kill me later i, uh, I mean like i said we can do another session later and, and you can talk because yeah. i feel like that's important i it's an important thing to talk about and yeah if it's if it's half an hour it could probably be an hour and um it's important right now man. yeah it's a big, big deal i know you speak to it as well i see you out there 
I mean, like, I remember when I was first, my first go at meeting anyone was, uh, I went to, you know, I did a couple shows, and then I went to an Eluxcon in, I think it was 2014 or 2015, I think it was the last year I was at Allentown, and I met Goni Montez there, who was a guy who, Goni pulled me aside and was just like, I know exactly what this is, he's like, you're a graphic designer, you know, because he could, he knew immediately without even me saying it that, I was a graphic designer turned illustrator. He's like, I can read all the compositions and all the graphic elements and your stuff. He's like, I'm a graphic designer turned illustrator. He's like, there's only a couple of us in the industry. He's like, don't quit. Like he, that was his advice to me. Right? <laughs> He's like, just keep, cause I was like, at that time I was doing a lot of fan art. So it wasn't like, um, you know, it was like Spider-Man, X-Men, all sorts of stuff, but I was just trying right. to figure out what I was doing. Um, but he, I'll, I'll embarrass him for a second, but cause the first time I met him, the, the, um, crit i asked him for a crit he was walking around with tommy arnold who tommy's amazing too right and i said yeah. can i get a crit from you and T- goni was a little drunk so he looked at my work and he like said a lot of rude things right but they were really good points that i had to learn and i took it all like i was just like cool this is goni montez this is stuff i need to learn and the next day he found me to apologize saying i i apologize for being rude in the way i said those things and i was just like I didn't think it was rude. I, I, in my head, I was like, this is just a, a great artist giving me a crit, right? But the one thing that stuck with me from him wasn't even that crit, was the fact that he said, there's only, you know, you're, you're doing good work, just keep at it. And John, you said something similar to me at Spectrum. I mean, I, I talked to you and had you look over my work too, and you said the same thing. Like, you've got something here, just keep at it. Like, like I remember that year we were talking about, like, I was, I thought I was going to be up for maybe an a up and comers award and I didn't win it, you know? And, you were like, it's fine. It's not, it's not, it's just an award. It's not a big deal. He's like, you have something here, keep at it. And that, those kind of things stick with me, even though it's little things, but they stick with you. Right. So I kept at it and I'm still learning and I'm still changing. So, um, representation is important. There's only so many people. I feel like there aren't that many artists of, there are a lot of artists of color, but we don't stand out as well. Um, I I mean, it's not just representation for representation's sake. It's, it's the idea of, that cultural perspective that comes along with us being brought into sort of the mainstream. And when I say mainstream, I don't mean mainstream in the way like an advertising agency says mainstream. I mean in the main space stream of storytelling, the world stream, so to speak. Maybe that's a better way to say it than mainstream, the world stream. You know, it's there is sort of a very white focus, at least in this country, in the U.S., right? And so... I mean, we're all inspired by it. We've all been grown up with it, but adding to that and expanding that. Um, and I think it's not just for our own communities, right? I think that's something I've been telling my Mexicanx people is that, you know, we, we need to be able to kind of lift up not just ourselves, but the people coming up behind us in our culture, but other cultures that are also underrepresented. And um, that's where the real power is. It's not just sort of lifting up your own uh, community, but making sure that others who are, who are maybe even more oppressed than ours is, making sure those are represented and bringing them into that world stream. Um, I'm, I'm very much all about that right now. I always have been, but I think it's only in recent years have I had the confidence yeah. and maybe the opportunities to really do something about it. So thankfully it's happening. I'm glad that's to see awesome. it. Maybe that's, that's the best way to end the conversation right now. Yeah, that's fine. That's great. Yeah. Well, yeah. I appreciate you being on. Uh, I know it's Saturday and you're super busy. Yeah. Um, so, and Andrew, thanks again for co-hosting with me again. I know he's got a kid at home too, like me. So sometimes it's a balance. Um, but, thanks, uh, fellas. Keep, keep going. I really love what you're doing. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, I'll post the links to all your stuff uh, on the video after this, which should, in theory, go live as soon as we go off air. So. Oh, wow. Um, well, thanks everyone. Thanks. Thanks for watching, guys. Out. We had a couple yeah, yeah. Of viewers, which is Thank nice. Thank you for watching. Um, right. Let me take, take us off. Take care, guys. Give me one second. Bye bye.